knee. You know? <laughs> Let me kneel once more. You ever feel that way? I'm not going to ask you to kneel, but if you felt that way, why, why, why don't you stand? Say, Lord, I'm just standing to say thank you. you. Do that. You can stand. You don't have to say a word. Just you know, you're not taking a knee. You're just standing. Say, Lord, thank you. I mean, you've been so good to me. Thank you. Amen. Well, God bless you. You, you can be seated. I was afraid to ask some of you to stand. I thought you might start running. So, but anyway. <laughs> All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Lamentations. That's kind of a <coughs> a difficult book to think about after singing and worshiping the Lord like that. Lamentations chapter number 3. Really, I have as our text to begin reading in verse number <clears throat> 1, um, and we'll read down through verse 26, and this is difficult when you start thinking about what Jeremiah's writing, but I want you to notice the turn and that this, uh, the words that he writes when we get to the latter portion of this in verses 23 through 26. I am the man that hath seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He hath led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Surely against me as he turned, he turneth his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin hath he made old, he hath broken my bones. He hath builded against me and compassed me with gall and travail. He has set me in a dark dark places as they that be dead of old. He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. Also when I cry and shout, he shutteth out my prayer. He hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He hath made my paths crooked. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait and as a lion in secret places. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He hath made me desolate. He hath made me desolate. He hath bent his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. He hath caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins or my heart. The arrows, many arrows, has entered my heart. I was a derision to all my people and their song all the day. He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunken with wormwood. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot prosperity. And I said my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remembering my afflictions and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, Verse 20 of Lamentations 3. My soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. Well, there's not a lot of hope in the previous reading, right? But he said that this is what caused him to have the hope that had perished. It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Yes, amen. Amen. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we need you. We need you every hour. But Lord, we especially need you in this hour that you might communicate to us, God, your message this morning. I confess, Lord, that I don't have the ability, the talent, the gift. God, only you can really speak to the heart of your children and help them to hear the shepherd's voice and and God, direct them. Direct them to yourself. Draw them near to you. And Lord, help us to realize that you've given us opportunities 
even this very day. This day itself is an opportunity. But also, Father, obligations in that opportunity. And so help us, Lord, to respond to you today, God, to do your will in all things. Lord, if there's one here that's unsaved, I pray you draw them this morning to Christ. I pray, Father, that you'd help the Christian that's really struggling on the outside. Everyone thinks that they're doing well, but they know in the dark places, in the times that they're alone, the sin that's trapped them. I pray, God, that you'd help them to see that there's a way of deliverance today, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. God, help us in this very moment to speak to your hearts and help us to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. How many of you have ever stopped and dreamed, daydreamed perhaps, about going back in time and starting all over? Have you ever done that? Man, if I could go back, and especially knowing what I know now, have you ever thought that to yourself? I knew then what I know now. Uh, and you think that you go back and do it a lot better, right? Uh, uh, just for fun's sake, I know you can't do this, but if you did go back, how many of you would invest in Apple and Microsoft? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now that's impossible. Uh, you only have one life to live. It's once appointed and demand to die, and after this judgment, you have one life. You're never going to come back there is no reincarnation. You don't have a second chance to redo it. This is it. His mercies are new every morning. This is the, this is the only opportunity you have to live for Christ. Is this very moment in time, this, this opportunity right now that we have. When you read this section in Lamentation, it's kind of shocking, isn't it? This is, I believe this is Jeremiah. He's the, pen, he's the author of the book of Lamentation and he is the one who's saying all these things that have befallen me. I, I've gone through this, this horrible, difficult time. By the way, the, 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 the title of the book itself should give us a hint, a hint as to the sorrow that's in his heart. Amen? And he said, I'm, I'm not just weeping, I'm not just concerned uh, I'm not just crying. I am wailing. I, I'm, I'm, I'm broken. I'm crying out in an extreme way. I am in a state of intense agony. Agony as I lament all that's taken place. And you, if you've read the, the, the book of Jeremiah, you know he was the prophet sent of God to warn the people. He did a great job in warning the people, but nobody listened. And the army kept getting closer and closer and his message was more urgent and urgent and they got deafer and deafer in their response. And finally, God, keeping his word because his people refused to repent, allowed the Babylonians to come in and execute wrath and judgment against the rebellious people and Jeremiah was watching it all, recording it all, and experiencing it all. In Lamentations, he talks about the walls that were destroyed and, and the children that were slain and the women that were violated in the streets. I, I'm talking about savage, savageness, like probably we have never even imagined as his heart is broken as he sees the people of God experiencing such cruelty at the hands of Gentile nation. And he's going through this in his mind. And he's picturing how he's personally experienced the wrath of God. And then he talks about how that God has seemed to put him in a surrounding. I can't go this way. If I go this way, I met with a hedge of misery. If I go this way, I met with a hedge of, of sorrow and agony. If I go forward, I, every direction that I go, he's just in uh, kept about me, just trouble on every side. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. If you lost a loved one or a child or you're going through some difficulty, sometimes it feels like that, doesn't it? Yeah. And then he says, the, it's like a walking and, and the bear has just been waiting for me and a lion is there and, 
and they didn't, don't just uh, jump out and growl. They catch me and they rip me and maul me. That's what it feels like in my heart that a, a lion has just mauled me. And said it, It's kind of like a, an, a, an archer. And I'm sitting out there and he's just shooting one arrow after another into my heart. This is what my heart feels like. It's being pierced over and over again at the hand of a skilled archer. And then he comes to something and he said, but, but my hope, my hope is dead. It's gone. I don't have any hope. Have, have you ever felt that way? I don't have any hope whatsoever. Nothing is ever going to change. I mean, it's going to be this way. It's been this way. Uh, hope has run out. There's no reason to expect anything different whatsoever. It, hope is just God. I don't have any hope. And then he said, but I recall something. I remember. I, I remember that the Lord is merciful. I, I remember that He is compassionate. That, that, that there, those mercies are new every morning. It, it, I've, I've gone through a terrible time, a time probably like none of us could even imagine going through, and yet God comes to His prophet and He says to His prophet, listen, I've got mercy for today. And I'm compassionate towards you today. I really do care. Could you imagine going through all that and someone telling you God cares, and you think, well, I don't know if God cares. I don't. I just don't know. Have you ever felt that way? Yeah. I don't know if God really cares or not. And Jeremiah said, oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. Yeah. He is the faithful God. He is the God that cares. He is a compassionate God. And the truth is, he's the God that cares about you. He, he, he doesn't just care about His Son, Jesus. And Jesus doesn't just concern Himself with the will of the Father. He entered into this world to suffer on a cross the worst death that He could die for you because He loves you. Not just because He loves all these other sinners in the world, and I guess I just somehow was added in, you know, the Apostle Paul says it so wonderfully in Galatians 2. He loved me and gave himself for me. And the truth is, every single one of us can honestly say, Jesus loved me and he gave himself for me. When he was on the cross suffering, I was on his mind. And you can say the same thing because it's absolutely true. He loved you enough to die for you on a cruel cross. Amen. And so I want to encourage you this morning by just hopefully getting you to stop and think about no matter how difficult the past is, right? God cares about you today. His mercy is directed towards you today. Uh, his loving compassion is directed towards you today. His great is His faithfulness. His mercies are new every morning. Today's a new day. In fact, it's the first day of the rest of your life. Isn't it? Amen. You ever give that any thought? They've been, uh, Jeremiah's been through one of the most worst, difficult times in his life. But let me tell you something, that's past. Now is a new day, a new opportunity. There's no telling what awaits Jeremiah down the road, but he is here now for what God has for him now. And the same thing is true for you as well. Amen? Right. You're here because God delights in you being here. And so I want you to think about the reality. What, what does a new day bring? What is the reality of that? <clears throat> Someone said, since every day is a little lifetime it, in itself, it, since every day is a little lifetime in itself, get an early start in living it to its fullest. Amen. Right? Every day is kind of like a lifetime in itself, isn't it? R remember the 
Peter said one day with the Lord is a thousand years. Remember that? We like quoting that a lot. Don't we? What, what did he go on to say? <laughs> a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. To the Lord, one day is as a thousand years. Now I'm not saying, I'm, but I'm saying to you this day is an important day. This day could set the course of the rest of your life. In fact, it could set the course of your eternity. This very moment in time. Isn't that true? Yeah. <laughs> Someone else said, live each day as if it were your last. It might be. Yeah. Right? We don't have any promise of tomorrow and we can't go back yesterday and redo that day. The only thing that we could, can do is to live this day today. And realize that God has allowed us to live this day mercifully for a reason. You didn't just wake up this morning because God said, "All right, I'm just, I'm just going. I don't have any purpose for their life. I don't have any investment, no interest whatsoever. I'm just going to let them wake up today and wander aimlessly through life." No. He woke you up this morning because he is, he is mindful of you. He is compassionate towards you. He has a will for you. Listen, you may not recognize that, but that's the reality. You are living because he wills you to live. The only reason you're breathing this morning is because God desires that you have breath in your lungs. That's it. I watched a, a story about uh, a movie... It said to, <coughs> to catch a thief. Is that the name of the movie? And the guy, remember, he wrote a fraudulent checks, and then he acted like he was a, a pilot, and then he fooled the people that he was a doctor and a lawyer. Uh, catch me if you can. Thank you, Brother Phil. I appreciate that. And here was the guy that actually was the person that lived that. He's worked for the FBI now over 40 years. And he said that his dad, when he was real young, would come into the bedroom every night. And he was six foot three. He said he'd kneel down and get close to my ear and he would say, I love you. I love you very much. But he said at the age of 16, he went to court and he didn't know what was going on. He thought everything was fine as a family. And he stood before a judge and the judge said, now young man, you have to choose who you're going to go live with. Are you going to go live with your mother or are you going to go live with your father? Could you imagine that? Being 16 year old and someone says, you're going to have to make a decision right now. Choose either your mother or choose your father. And he said he ran out of the courtroom weeping and he ran away. That's when he started all of his fraudulent checks. Well, later on in his life he got caught in France for fraud, writing fraudulent checks and put in prison. He said when he entered the prison, he entered at 189 pounds. When he left, he weighed 109 pounds slept on the floor with a blanket. There was nothing but a hole in there for the bathroom. But meanwhile, his dad at the age of 57 was in New York City walking up the subway stairs and he slipped. At the age of 57, a healthy man slipped and he went to grab the railing but missed it and he fell to his death at the age of 57. <clears throat> and he didn't even know it because he was in prison. You see, life is short. You may think I'm healthy, I can do all these things, but the reality is it doesn't take but just a slip on the steps and you're in eternity. It doesn't take but just a moment in the car accident and you're going to be in either heaven or hell. You, you, right now you are just hanging in the hands of God's mercy. That's it. You know, Paul said it this way in Acts chapter 17, and, and he borrowed the words of a prophet, not a poet, not a prophet, uh, secular words, worldly words. And he said, one of your own poets have said this, in him, God, we live and move and have our being. We exist in him, we live in Him, we move in Him, and without Him there'd be no life whatsoever, right? 
I, I, what I'm trying to get all of us to see this morning, you got out of your bed this morning because of God's mercy. Amen. Jeremiah looked at all that he'd been through and he thought, I'm here <laughs> just by God's mercy. I could have been one that had been wiped out among the thousands, but for some reason God chose to see me through to this day. The reality is you have the opportunity today to live. Not just exist. Amen? Right. What does this day bring? This day brings you opportunity. Yep. It brings you the opportunity of salvation if you're lost. And don't make light of that. Don't fool yourself and think, well, what are you talking about, preacher? I've got all the time in the world to worry about eternity. That's not true, is it? If you're unsaved, God's mercy has led you to this day because He desires that you repent of your sin and receive Christ because there is a real, literal hell that He's trying to keep you out of. And there is a wonderful relationship with Him that He desires with you and the only opportunity you have to do anything about it is this moment right now. Remember what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Now is the time of salvation. Yeah. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. This is the moment. <laughs> and I think a lot of times we have kind of just uh, fooled ourselves because we've lived so long and we've gone from one day to the next day to the next day to the next day. Are you with me? And we think it's just going to keep going like that, don't we? It's not. That's not the case. You may not see the sunrise in the morning. You say, preacher, why is that important? Because... God, had dealt, God has already dealt with a multitude that has passed the day of His mercy and He's cast a multitude in hell that are in hell this very moment. They're there now, literally, suffering because they refuse one thing to receive Christ as their personal Savior. And right now they're living in that place of the damned. Right now, burning, screaming, grieving, tortured, because their day passed them by without them putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, right? Amen. Remember Luke 16, the rich man who fared sumptuously every day, he lived the highest that you can enjoy, the best of the best, and then the Bible says, and the rich man died and was buried, and that's the end of the story? No! The rich man died and was buried and lifted up his eyes in hell being in torments. That was recorded 2,000 years ago, and I don't know who Jesus was talking about. And I've been talking about a man that lived thousands of years before his day. But he said, I want to tell you about a rich man who lost the opportunity of salvation, passed that by. Did, did he know about salvation? Surely he knew. He said, Preacher, how do you know that? He said... Send someone to my five brethren. Tell them about this place. I don't want them to come here. Right? And, and what I'm trying to get you to see this morning is that that potentially could be you if you don't receive Christ and trust Christ and you say, well, I've got all the time in the world I'm going to put off being saved today. Can I tell you again my salvation experience that God had been dealing with me for quite a time and I was sitting in the back of the church probably about like Brother Duke is there and, and I got under conviction on a Sunday night and my heart started pounding in my chest <coughs> and I was holding on to the pew <laughs> and I knew what salvation was then I, I didn't know it before uh, at that time but God revealed to me what it was to be saved it was not how perfect I was it was how perfect Christ was yes. and then if I trust him I could have eternal life and I was holding on because I didn't want to let go of sin even though sin was just killing me and then I heard the Holy Ghost say to me not out loud in an audible voice but he said Tom if you don't go today you're never going to be saved 
So I let go of the pew and walked down to the altar and put my faith and trust in Christ. And he saved me. <laughs> I knew it was decision time. Today was the day. I was, I was not going to have another chance. This was it. And the same thing may be true about you today, about some area in your life as well. You have the opportunity today to make things right with God. For you as a Christian, we make, we make the same mistake as a lost person makes, right? We procrastinate about our spiritual development and growth, but for some reason, God has merciful allowed us to exist today, and I do believe that He'd have us to deal with our spiritual state, wouldn't you? How many Christians have just stayed the same day after day after day after day? And in a sense, gotten really worse and worse and worse. They've been saved, but that's it. How many of you know folks like that? Been saved, saved for years, but they don't know about Noah. Right? You can say Moses built the ark, and they say, whoa, that's wonderful. Amen. Isn't that true? Because they never opened their Bible, they never studied, they never memorized, they never prayed. They got their ticket to heaven. They're satisfied with it. They're living for the world. And God, in His mercy, got you out of bed this morning and said, Now listen, do something about your spiritual life. Remember that story, the parable? The husbandman had the fruit trees and that was one tree in the ground and it wouldn't produce anything. And the owner of the vineyard said, I want you to go out there and cut that tree down. And you plant a tree that's going to produce something. Now do you all think that's in there just for a funny little story? Do you think that has an application to us and our spiritual life? Paul said, I preach to others and I don't want to be a castaway. And that word castaway is an important word. It could mean simply that we're set on the shelf as unusable. I can't use him. I'm going to just put him on the shelf. I'm going to look for somebody else that I can use. But here's the tree and the one who cares for the garden said, please, Master, give me one more chance. One more day. Let me go out there and, and dig about it so it gets some air and put some fertilizer there and water it and and just give me one more opportunity and the owner said you've got one more shot. I think he's saying to us, listen, I am looking for some fruit in your life. I am not interested in just you sitting on a few. I didn't say you just sit on a few. I'm worthy of fruit. I am. Christ says I'm worthy of fruit. I should see something being produced in your life that brings me glory. I, I want people to see my power working in your life. It's the day of opportunity for the saint to be sanctified, to grow in our holiness. None of us should ever be satisfied where we're at. Paul wasn't, was he? I mean, most of us say he's the greatest Christian ever walked on faith of the earth, plus Apostle Paul, Right? And yet, what did Paul say in Philippians chapter 3? Forgetting those things which are behind and pressing towards those things that are before, I press towards the mark. And he is, he is saying, I'm not sitting on the pew just leaning forward. He said, I'm nearing the end of the race. Here's the finish line. And I'm straining to get across first. Somehow we've lost that sense uh, in Christianity, haven't we? I don't know what doctrine has caused that, but it's the doctrine of the devil. Because Christ wants us growing and growing and growing and growing and growing until he says, all right, that's it. I I'm through with you now. Come on home. And if we sit here unsanctified and unchanged, it's not his fault at all. It's our fault. We're as close to God as we really want to be. If you want to be closer, you can be. Amen? My father-in-law used to tell a little story about an older couple that were riding down the road. The older gentleman was driving and his wife was on the other side at the window and they passed a young couple and they were all 
tangled up on the other side together near the steering wheel. They were almost one person. The older gentleman said, you know, we, we used to sit... No, the, the, young, the wife said, you know what, we used to sit like that. We used to be real close like that. And the older gentleman said, I ain't moved. <laughs> and God has not moved. Not out of rebellion, not out of a desire for fellowship, not out of a love that's growing cold. If, if we've gotten further away from Him, it's our fault. To the Ephesians, again, He said, you have left your first love. But He said, repent, return, remember. You, you can get it back, and today's the day that you need to get it back. Amen? You need to get that passion back. You need to get back in the altar. You need to open up your... You, Listen, if you keep saying we're going to do it tomorrow, tomorrow never, ever comes. We have a miracle day at our house. Do y'all have a miracle day at your house? Our miracle day is Monday. That's our miracle day. You know why it's a miracle day? Because we're always going to do it on Monday. Y'all have a day like that? Like, we're going to do this. Well, let's, let's start that Monday. Miracle day is not so miraculous. We find ourselves saying over and over again, well, we're going to start that on Monday. And if you always put it off and you always procrastinate, you're never going to take advantage of, of what God wants to do and can do in your life. It's an opportunity. It brings an opportunity. Jeremiah seized on that. He said, I can look at the past or I can look at what God can do today. And if I seek Him and I draw near to Him, He'll draw near to me. I, I know that, that I can have a wonderful... Hope is not gone. I do have hope. My hope's in Christ. But also, it's an obligation. It brings an obligation with it. Because if you keep saying, tomorrow, 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 you're never going to change. Isn't that true? If it's always, and listen, don't be deceived, right? Because how many of you, you know for sure, without a doubt whatsoever, that you're going to see the sunrise in the morning? Would you lift your hands up? You know without a doubt, I'm, I'm going to see the sunrise in the morning. So all you have, all you have, right? If, today, if, it's, a, if it's a little life in itself, why not take advantage of this life in itself today and say, I, I'm going to start making those decisions and I'm really obligated to Christ to make some decisions about today. You know why sometimes we don't make decisions about today? Because we worry about tomorrow and we worry about yesterday. Right? Well, I've always been wanting to do this and I have never done it. Have you ever said that? I mean, I've always thought about that, but I've never done it. <laughs> well, guess what? You can do it today. Amen? So I, I really want to start a habit of reading my Bible every day. Well, go home and open up your Bible and read it. Bruce has a brother, uh, and he said that his brother had made a commitment that he was going to read his Bible every day before he ate anything. No Bible reading, no food. And he shared with uh, Bruce that there has not been a day in his life that he's missed reading, his, reading the Bible. And I thought to myself, that's a powerful testimony. He committed when he was a young man, I'm going to read my Bible every day. You know what that takes to do that though? It takes that new mercy in the morning, the compassion of the Lord, and you saying, God, today I don't, I don't want to waste my day today. I want to do something today that's going to help me in my walk with you. I want to spend some time with you. And listen, the truth is all of us could do that. Amen? If you have morning time with Him or evening time with Him, it doesn't matter. Just have time with Him. It brings opportunity, but it also brings an obligation. We should do our best to show the world how great the Lord Jesus Christ is. Isn't that true? I want you to think about the rewards 
of living each day for Christ. We read 20 some odd verses of Jeremiah saying things like this, and thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot prosperity. And I said my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. 20, 20 some odd verses. You know, Jeremiah could have looked on his life and he could have committed the sin of what if. Right? How many of you think that he probably thought that he was an absolute failure? When he saw all those people suffer and die, the city burnt. How I many of you thought he probably had a lot of what ifs? I would think he probably said something like this What if I had been a better prophet? What if I had been a better prophet? Could the city have been spared if I was like some of the great prophets of old? Could it have been spared if I was like some of the greater if I was more like Elijah or Elisha, could it have been spared if I was a better prophet? What if I was a better prophet? He probably said, what if I had a better prayer life? What if I just got a hold of God a little bit more? Maybe if I just cried a little more. Maybe if I just fasted some more and spent more time with God. Maybe, maybe the people's ears would have been open and they could have been saved. Do you, any of you think that he might have thought those kind of thoughts? What if? What if I'd have done this? What if I had went to the people more and loved them more and spent more time with them? Could it could it have been that I I just didn't get the influence in them that I needed to? What if and what if and what if and listen, you can what if yourself to death. The truth is, he couldn't do anything about yesterday. Right? But every day after that, this day, if God lets the sun rise in the morning, I've got another opportunity. And listen, if we would live that simple life, that simple life, I'm not saying you shouldn't make plans, five-year plans or ten-year plans. I'm not saying that, but, but you know this. If you don't plan, you're never going to work out that plan, are you? Isn't that true? If you don't plan, you're never going to even work on a plan. I'm not saying you shouldn't plan and prepare and think and if God gives me grace and I live this long, I'd love to be doing this for Christ. But listen, if you're going to be doing this for Christ, you have to start doing those things that will get you there. And the only way to do that is to take a step every day. Isn't that true? But the reward is if we are faithful today, then it won't be long we'll stand before Him as faithful Christians. Whether, whatever, however God chose to use our lives. Amen? If we are faithful today, one day we'll stand before Him and we'll be rewarded for that faithfulness. I heard about a, a, a poor, poor lady. She worked at the IRS and they overlooked her. They didn't give her raises like she should have got. She had a meagerly salary back in those days of a little over $5,000 and she lived a very frugal life. She, she bought second-hand furniture. She never got anything new. And uh, when she died, she sent a college over $7 million. And they said, How, where in the world did this lady living in this simple little apartment come up with so much money? She invested a little bit of her money in the stock market every single day of her life. And when she got dividends off of it, she reinvested those into the stock market. Even though she lived a meager life, at the end of her life, she had great material rewards. And I'm not, I'm not saying pursue money. Just think about that in the spiritual context. You don't have to make... You don't have to read your Bible all day long. You don't have to pray all day long. If you can make some steady, consistent investments... One day they're going to bear great fruit to God's glory. Amen? Amen. Now you have today, you have this morning, you have this altar, and you can use that for God. Amen? 
Some of you need God to give you grace about the past and help you to understand that He's in control of all things. He doesn't make any mistakes. No matter how bad the past was, listen, you can't live your life blaming other people. You're never going to get anywhere. Right? If it's always somebody else's fault, you can't change somebody else. The only person you can change is yourself. Amen? So if you're waiting on them to change, you're stuck. The only person that can change is you. Amen? If you're unsaved, come to Christ this morning because this is really the only opportunity you have to be a Christian. Amen? I mean, I'm telling you the truth. That's it. And if there's a need in your life today, would you come to Christ for that need? Because this is the only time He can meet that need. It's right now. Amen? Will you do that? Let's stand for prayer. Father, I thank You, Lord, for Your Word. I thank You for helping Jeremiah. Lord, helping him to recall that even though all those things befell the people of God, that You, Lord, our compassion, your mercies new every morning. You're very near to them that call upon your name. Lord, I ask you today that you'd help those that are in this service, the unsaved, that they'd realize, Lord, what a solemn opportunity this is. There are thousands and thousands of people in hell that had this very moment in their life and they walked away from Jesus Christ. Because they walked away from Christ, now they're in that awful place of eternal torment. God, help them to come to you today and accept Christ as their Savior. And Christians, Lord, they're just struggling, kind of stuck in the mud, and just a a ditch, and they don't know how to get out. Lord, help them to realize that, that today you can help them. They'll come to you and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I need you. And Lord, I know that you'll hear their cry and meet their need. So God, help them today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and ask these things. Amen. What page, Brenda?